Top Med Talk. All right. Well, hello and welcome to Top Med Talk. We are here in Singapore for 2024 World Congress of Anesthesiologists, brought to you by the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists. I'm Desiree Chapel, your host, and it has been an amazing three days. We are almost at the end of our time here in Singapore in the exhibit hall. It's been a phenomenal meeting. One of the things that we have loved the most is being able to network and meet people from all over the world, all corners of the world, all walks of life. If you want to hear more, please do check out Top Med Talk. So as I said, one of the great things about um, the World Congress every year, but this year in particular, we have not been together for over eight years now or about eight years. The buzz here has been great. And at dinner last night, we had assigned seating. So we had a table that we had to go to. And the table was just filled with the interesting people from, you know, all the corners of the world. And sitting next to me was an anesthesiologist from the Ukraine. And I have asked Liz to join us here on Top Med Talk and her colleague as doctors in the Ukraine during this time of war. So I wanted to thank you both so much for joining us here on Top Med Talk. Liz, why don't you kick us off and tell us a little bit more about yourself? It was a pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. It's really honored to talk to you in this format. So I'm an anesthesiologist for more than like 15 years already. For now, I'm working in the private sector and with the military guys as well. And I'm deputy director of anesthesia, transplantology and pain management in my clinic. And also I am a chief of anesthesia department there. One of the things I found very interesting is, is some of the research that you're working on. We are working on epigenetic in anesthesia and especially about epigenetic for medicines that we actually use during the surgeries and DNA mutilation, how it impacts our patient and how it impacts post-operative cognitive disorder. I wanted to introduce your colleague, Dimitra. Thank you for taking the time out and coming uh, and chatting with us here on Top of My Talk. Uh, my name is Dimitra Zuba, professor of uh, Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care of National Healthcare University in Kiev and the head of anesthesiology intensive care department in Kyiv Regional Hospital and head of Kyiv Region Association of Anesthesiologists. Very glad to be here and to speak with you and to share my experience. We have a lot of and practice and scientific work. Yeah. Uh, different fields of anesthesiology, some like uh, trauma anesthesiology, a lot of designs of regional anesthesia and especially goal is to find out personalized anesthesia like opioid use and even we have a communication with our fundamental science like with biochemistries, with physiologists to find out how uh, general anesthetics influence in electropotential of cell. It's uh, wow. very, a lot, a lot, of, a lot yeah. of things we do on our department. Yeah. So being here at the meeting and meeting people from all over the world and and hearing about what it's like to practice anesthesia, and they're part of their little niche and microcosm. How does it compare with the anesthesia that you're practicing in the Ukraine? I'm working in the private sector. I used to live for some time in New York City and was doing observership in Mount Sinai. So I I have to something to compare with. Yeah. In the private sector, it's really, really close to the even to the U.S., but if we're going to talk more about government hospitals, mm-hmm. I mean, like a, about public hospitals. So is it much like the UK or in Europe where they may have government or public hospitals and private? And is there a portion of the country that are only going to have public care and you have to pay extra for private care? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's okay. the same there. And if we're going to talk about public hospitals, so they definitely need money, equipment, yeah. all things like that. So yeah. in the private hospitals, we are more than okay. I mean, like we close to USA standards. Uh-huh. And have all the resources and things that you yeah. need. Do you feel like you're well-staffed with anesthesiologists? No, it's under- and especially from the beginning of the war, a lot of doctors actually love the country. So we have a problem with the doctor staff, but with nurses, it's critical now. It's yeah. not enough. Yeah. And I could add, uh, because Lisa, as she said, in a, a private sector and I'm more in the regular hospital, so uh, we have really critical problems with the staff because uh, the financial supply is quite hard now 
and it is Vora and a lot of colleagues are in the field now, anesthesiologists and anesthesiologic nurses. And with supply, it's not so good as in the private sector. But when we the start of war, a lot of our international colleagues, especially United Kingdom, United States of America, help us with supply and with helping of some online because we have now uh, in our clinics a project with Mayo Clinic, so we huh. we might um, hour and a half uh, might uh, from the beginning of the war have a common project with uh, common lectures. They help me with uh, handling round and so some heart patients with support of in um, treatment. And now we have some supply with humanitarian help with some anesthetic machines with some equipment. So. It's getting better now, but uh, a lack of personnel and uh, a lack of financing of the sector because most of money in our government makes to the war. So do you feel that before the war there was a staffing shortage already? It was before the war as well, but since the war, it just gets worse. Talk to us about what it's like to train in the UK. I mean, both of you are affiliated with the university there. Residency for training, uh, training doctors there. Yeah, there we we still have training doctors. Yeah, they're not going to leave. I yeah. feel like someone of them are preparing for leaving, so they want to do residency in Ukraine and uh-huh. then move on to Germany or some European um, other country. Yeah, but we still have training and we are teaching. And my hospitals and Dmitry hospitals, they are both our teaching hospitals. Uh huh. So we're trying to use a lot of simulation. And I think that the experience, actually, our training can get now during the war zone, it is priceless because they can work with so many damages, injuries, and sometimes without any resources. So it's really brilliant experience for them. Yeah, actually, individual, what would you say? Yes, uh, I totally agree. Uh, we don't have lack of trainees now in our department every year in university, about uh, 60, 70 trainees. And we have three years uh, education, so in our departments, more than uh, two two hundreds of uh, trainees now. Wow. And they have a lot of shifts. So we have a lot of trauma care now, especially in our hospital. We have regular trauma and then head and neck surgery a lot because we have now uh, like a military system of healthcare nowadays. So we have three lines of uh, helping first line. It's the first help, then they go to the military prayer border hospitals, and then they go to the higher specialized hospital mm-hmm. like ours now. And so we have a hospital on the 500 beds, and about 150 now it is military, so young soldiers who have trauma. Um, wow. And is that somewhere at your place? No, because it's private. We, uh, yes. It's, uh, uh, no, we do. We do yeah. have. We work a lot of uh, with the foundation. We had this feeling that we need to do something, even we are private. And the first year, actually, we were working like a public, so we didn't charge our patients, especially if there were a military patients. Mm-hmm. Now we're working with Direct Relief Foundation, uh-huh. it's USA uh-huh. Foundation, and they're covering all expenses for military treatment. Oh, wow. So we have combats. Yeah. They're covering these charges. So what would you say, I mean, the majority of people listening to the podcast would never have been in a time of war or had to practice in, in the type of situations that you guys are. So can you give us a little idea of, you know, what a day in your life is like? It's a really interesting topic. Like about maybe one year ago, I uh, attending ultrasound course in New York City in Velcorno. Uh, college, and I was uh, also giving a talk about what challenges do we have at the first few months, because it was probably the worst time when you are not prepared, you don't know what to do, how to do, so you need to do reconstruction of all your business processes, yeah. and as well as like clinical process. Yeah. And we had really a lot of challenges. It was crazy time. You know, people so adaptive. Mm. Yeah. Like everyday things for us, there will be crazy for everyone. Yeah. Else. Anyone else looking into that would be like, oh, that was insane. Yeah. Uh, the same, uh, the biggest problem is, for example, when you have uh, operating room is ongoing surgery and you have bomb attack, 
Yeah. So the first question you will ask, what we're supposed to do, like patient is under anesthesia in surgery, he is open up. Mm -hmm. So what we have to do, transfer him. So definitely yeah. we don't transfer our patients with right. staying and yeah. operating, but operating rooms are mostly not in underground. They're like yeah. on uh, fixed floor, dance floor. So that's yeah. why it's what about as far as like electricity and water and all of those things? Is that something that has been impacted by all of it? I think that all mostly all hospitals all are adapted for this as well. So we have generators. Yeah, we do water reservation. So I would uh, divide this uh, all period in uh, two two big moments. Uh, first, like Lisa said, that when uh, it begins in our special hospital, all who was near the hospital. Our state in the hospital, we was about, totally, we have more than 100 personnel in our Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. Uh -huh. But in that moment, it was about 20, 25 people who lived in the hospital. I, and especially with my wife, lived for a three months uh, in my yeah. cabinet. Yes, Sir, in, the in the hospital. room. <laughs> yes, and at that time, it was a lack of personnel. It was lack of uh, drugs. It was lack of uh, all supply. Yeah. And sometimes there were no water, there were no electricity. We even talked by the walkie-talkie in our uh, hospital because it was a critical moment. But if, till th this time we adapted. So we adapted because uh, last winter it was mighty rocket attacks on our energetic system. So all the hospitals in Ukraine, mightly all the hospitals have uh, now electric generator that turned the second line to have electricity supply and additional supply of water. We have some uh, management of it for nowadays. And nowadays, we already, like Lisa says, now we're adapted when even the rocket attacks, we shoot to work and we like deal with this. But for uh, people who wasn't in this situation, it is uh, very terrifying. But it is, I think, psychologically, it is a big trauma for men uh, that he adapted to this situation. Yeah. It is nor not normal for regular people because uh, before the war we never have a thought in our mind that in 21st century could yeah. be a war between two civilized countries but for this moment we can see the some political decision of it uh, and we should live in such conditions yeah we can pull up that list about drug deficit at the beginning we can manage patients that probably have to get some medicines yeah. but at least he can wait yeah but diabetes mellitus patient, patient after transplantology yeah. uh, on immunosuppression, patients are on dialysis. It was the biggest problem. Yeah. Because it's a super chronic patient in severe conditions and they couldn't get any help. Any they require a lot of... Uh, I mean, like, even drugstore, it was closed. Yeah. So everything was closed. They even couldn't buy it. Yeah. So and it was a challenge to manage these chronic patients mostly. I mean, like we know how to work with acute trauma, with injured, but when you have a patient and you know have a knowledge, if, but you don't have resources to help him. Yeah. Like in when fully, you did have it before. Yeah. And it was the you know everything was there that you needed, and then it's just abruptly taken away. Yeah. Chemotherapy, cancer patients. Yes. So they couldn't get chemo for the probably first five or six months. And the thing was that kids were transferred to another country to get chemo. Yeah. But adult patients, they were still being in Ukraine. They yeah. couldn't be transferred. So the war has been going on about 18 months now. So Honestly, we are fighting from the 12th. 14, but the total invasion is from 22 February of 2022. Oh, wow. So it's almost toward two years yeah. now. Yeah, beyond two years. I know that you said you it's that you don't know when the end is coming. What do you think are the, the biggest things that you have learned that you, you know, probably will continue through out and hopefully when the war is over? You mean in medicine or in Zisa? Mm, let me think about it. I think that a lot of people start to work with regional anesthesia and opioid free anesthesia more than it was before. And it's first thing I think med evacuation become more stronger. 
I think this uh, cooperation with military hospital and civilian hospital shows that it could be possible and it actually could work and could work for four patients. Mm -hmm. And the biggest problem now we're going to have, it's a patient with PTCD, post-traumatic stress disorder, yes. and patient in rehabilitation. I mean, like, we need to work to build our prosthetics clinic, to know how to rehabilitate them, so things yeah. like that. And adapt them to civilian life as well, because they are trust. Yeah, I mean, we've had that experience here in the U.S., with our military, and I'm sure all over the globe for any military situation. Yeah, because it's a, a truly agree, and I could uh, only add that uh, it is such our doctors now are ready for uh, the problems of any kind. Mm -hmm. So in these two years, we have such big challenges, and we handle it. And uh, after it, the doctors came the more professional that they were in the civilian times mm -hmm. and some psychological thing that we had after it that really the war uh, gave us the, the future understanding that all the mankind could help you because when it was these three months in Kiev and it was closed all the markets uh, there was no supply at all the people from the street came to hospital they bring food even we had such a thing that uh, two barbers uh, came to our hospital and for a day take some beauty like in a beauty salon to all who are in hospital so everybody who can do something they do something and it is consistent to the europe and united states at whole world because when it was an opportunity to get from the abroad we get big amount of different drugs, uh, even opioid, this, that we have not, but, uh, and we have not at all, but we had some new ones that we have no um, uh, experience, experience. Before. Yeah. and we have new experience, like we have only fentanyl, uh, for example, mm -hmm. and after a few months we have an experience with all fentanyl, sulfentanyl, oh, wow. with midazolam that we don't have before. So it's very, very interesting, I think. Yeah. So I think both of you have mentioned PTSD in kind of different settings, post-traumatic stress disorder. How are the doctors taking care of themselves and the nurses and the providers? I think like everybody, I mean, like uh, we see these changes in our patients. For example, we were talking about three years ago, we mostly didn't have any patients on antidepressants. And now it's everything is changes. I mean, like almost all patients, they're taking antidepressants one type or another, but still. Mm -hmm. We are trying our best. I mean, like, we're believing uh, in, in our victory and we are waiting and we are trying to do everything for this. But I think it's inspired every one of us. Yeah. yeah. And are there the, the society there or organizations that are helping kind of provide relief for the doctors? Yes, of course, because especially when we uh, spoke to our American colleagues and this uh, Tell around and so uh, they are helping us how to uh, convert this uh, PTSD like uh, group therapy. So mm -hmm. we started to speak one each other more to have uh, more conversation with uh, our uh, patients because anesthesiologist it is a person who uh, take care of patient not only his uh, arterial pressure or breathing uh, uh, so he is like a clinical psychologist. Uh, mm -hmm. And we speak with our patients during the intensive care, during the, uh, during the operation. And now we have uh, some system, of especially working with our nurses, to be uh, more uh, polite with the patients, to speak with them more. And uh, humanity, it is one of our goals now. Mm. So uh, even uh, we now get from the U.S. practice, uh, no to me board. Mm -hmm. For every person who are in ACU, they get this small uh, sheet of paper where is what we do, what he do, what he likes, what his name at home, how he mm -hmm. likes uh, that uh, we call him. And uh, this uh, humanity is uh, give uh, a letter of this PTSD. Yeah. Well, guys, uh, we have to wrap it up here today. I know you, you have to move on. Um I just want to say, first of all, thank you so much for taking the time to sit down with us. It means so much to me personally and to all of our, our listeners for Top Med Talk. So many of our listeners, I mean, they reach out and want to help in these types of situations. 
What would you say as someone practicing, if someone asked you, what can I do to help if I'm from the outside? Like, what would you say? Uh, I think we actually, we have a, a, a super big gap. And this gap, we don't have pain management education. I mean, like huh. fellowship. Uh -huh. So we are glad to get any help with the educational side of pain management. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Do you have people who are trained? I mean, some. No, no. no. So uh, I mean, like we are doing pain management. Yeah. But no one of us, I like, really don't train as a fellow. Fellow fellowship trained. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Okay. So helping with, you know, getting some different education. There are different ways to do that. I mean, like, we can win, but when we feel that all worlds supporting us, it's a really brilliant feeling. Oh, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. And yeah, the education is a really great thing because uh, the intensive care and anesthesiology approaches uh, in U.S. or uh, in the United Kingdom are very different from our classical intensive care and uh, all approaches. It is a very great thing, but as I work in a regular hospital, we are very appreciate uh, that foundations from all the world uh, helping us uh, with anesthetic machines, with uh, lung ventilation, with uh, some monitors and uh, other devices. They are very helpful because what we had is broken and not every hospital has the money to buy a new one. Yeah. And this help for more as old. We are very appreciated and thank you for your help in us. I'd love to stay in touch. We'd love to catch up with you guys to see how things are thank going. You. And we'll be glad to share our experience with mm -hmm. the combats uh, at the fields uh, in the hot zones. Yeah. So you're welcome. It's what we can do and share with you. I mean, like... Shed light. Yeah. Good luck getting back home. I know that there's always, there's already some challenges there for you guys. Uh, so good luck uh, to you all, and good luck whenever you're back at home. And yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for a notation. We yeah. hope for a victory. You will. And, it will be. Uh, and and, yeah. and uh, all are welcome to Ukraine because Ukraine is very beautiful yeah. and hospitality country. When it's safe. When it's safe. Well, we, you know, yes, yeah. absolutely. And thank you guys so much for listening to Top Men Talk. You know, you can always find us on your favorite social media platform, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, X. We are there. We are at topmedtalk.com. And lastly, find us on YouTube. We have some videos up there. Subscribe. Give us a thumbs up if there's something that you like. And the best thing that you can do as our listeners is to support our colleagues from the Ukraine and, and all of our colleagues around the world that are, find themselves in similar situations in war and in times of need. So thank you all so much for listening. Cheers. Top Med Talk. Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. Don't forget to subscribe, check us out on YouTube, and of course on social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and X. Also, it's important to remember that Top Med Talk is the broadcasting arm of EPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about that, and the way to do that is epom.org. Check out our website and find out about some of the incredible conferences we're going to be arranging across the year. edpom.org. <laughs>